Hey there, this is Dr. Pavan, your surgery educator on an academy platform and today I'm here to talk to you about the weekly within general surgery part 4. So let us begin without wasting any further time. So the first question which we have today is there is a patient who went for an upper G endoscopy for an esophageal cancer and after the procedure uh, we suspected that there is a perforation. Why? Because the patient complained of a significant new substernal pain. So we ordered a kind of an x-ray. On the x-ray we revealed that there is a air in the mediastinum which made the diagnosis of an esophageal perforation. Now what I'm trying to ask you is what is the most appropriate management of this particular patient? So I'll just summarize the question for you. Here we have a patient who went for an upper G endoscopy with BAPSI for an esophageal carcinoma. During the procedure something happened and there was a perforation. Post-operatively the patient uh, kind of complained of a substantial pain because of which we offered an x-ray which confirmed that there is a perforation present. Now what is the most appropriate management of this particular patient? So do you want to go for a spit fistula that is a pharyngostomy with an gastrostomy? Or do you want to go for a left thoracotomy with the pleural patch overswing of the perforation and the drainage of the mediastinum? Or do you want to go for a left thoracotomy with an esophagectomy or a thoracotomy with the chest tube drainage and the esophageal exclusion? So what do you think is the answer? So if you say that the answer to this particular question is option number 3, that is a left thoracotomy with an esophagectomy, you are absolutely correct. But why? Why is the answer C? Let us have a look at it. So let us summarize esophageal perforation. It's an important topic. So when will you suspect a patient to be suffering from an esophageal perforation? So let's say after the surgery or after the procedure, uh, the patient complains of a retrosternal pain or the patient present with shock or the patient comes to you with a kind of subcutaneous emphysema, you will suspect that maybe during the procedure there has been a perforation. Now a point to be noted is if at all you're performing an upper G endoscopy, that is a therapeutic upper G endoscopy that has a much more higher chance of esophageal perforation as compared to that if at all you're performing a diagnostic upper G endoscopy. And overall, if you see the most common causes, eatrogenic, that is an upper G endoscopy. Sometimes it may occur spontaneously also, like Boehrer syndrome, but most common causes an eatrogenic. Now, if you suspect a esophageal perforation, how will you diagnose it? So we have to go for a dye study. Which dye will you prefer? Will you prefer barium? Absolutely not. You will not prefer barium. Why? Because barium might cause mediastinitis. We don't want that. So what do we go for? We go for a water soluble dye. So we first go for a water soluble dye. But if at all the water soluble dye is not able to pick up the perforation, then we move on to the barium. So how do you proceed? You first go for a water soluble dye study. If at all you are able to diagnose a perforation, well and good. If you are not, then you proceed and do a barium study. And even if you go for a barium, you always use a diluted barium for this particular study. Okay, so you have basically diagnosed a patient as an esophageal perforation. How will you manage this patient? So whenever you consider the management of this particular patient, you have to take into consideration four things. What are these four things? The site of perforation, whether it is a cervical esophagus which is involved or is it the thoracic esophagus which is involved. Um, event causing it. So was it caused by an iatrogenic cause or was it a spontaneous perforation like a Boehrer syndrome? Uh, what is the underlying pathology or is there any underlying pathology like motility disorder or a stricture or a carcinoma is there any underlying pathology and the last point which you need to consider is contamination so is there a lot of contamination which has happened in the mediastinum or there is absolutely no contamination this is something which you need to take into consideration right now another important thing which you need to consider is what is the time from the uh, site uh, how, when when is the patient coming to you from the time of the perforation so if at all the patient is presenting to you or if at all you are diagnosing this perforation within 12 hours from the occurrence of the perforation you are able to go for a primary repair okay but if at all let's say the patient is coming to you late or you are taking time to diagnose the esophageal perforation after more than 12 hours from the time of the perforation you cannot go for a primary repair here you have to go for a delayed repair so what do you do in the delayed repair why why do you want to go for a delayed repair because by this time the site of the perforation the esophagus may have developed the edema and other things so you cannot go for the primary repair what do you have to do in here you have to go for a proximal esophagus choking this is what is called as a spit fistula why because this proximal esophagus tummy will help you in taking out whatever the salivary secretions and all the patient is having you will have to take it out by the spit fistula which is pharyngoesophagostomy and the same time you want the patient like you want to feed the patient so you have to go for a feeding gastrostomy or a feeding jejunostomy uh, whatever you feel comfortable with
this is how you manage a patient of an esophageal perforation now the last point which i want to make is let's say if at all there is some underlying pathology so let's say the patient is having a motility disorder or let's say the patient is having a stricture or a malignancy as in this particular case you have to go in and treat the underlying pathology okay so whenever if at all even if the patient is coming within 12 hours whenever you go inside whenever you perform a thoracotomy you have to treat the underlying pathology now coming back to this particular question what did the patient have patient had a esophageal carcinoma so if you want to treat a primary or like uh, the pathology you would have to go for a esophagectomy and this is the reason why the answer to this particular question is left thoracotomy with a esophagectomy now yeah the confusion would boil down to option number b and c why is the option number c and not option number b because if at all the patient did not have any underlying pathology you would have gone for option number b but here the patient is having an underlying pathology that is a uh, esophageal carcinoma and that is the reason why you'll have to go for a esophagectomy will you perform a gastric conduit and go for the anastomosis at the same time maybe not but you will have to remove the esophagus at this particular point i hope you get this this is what the answer is now let's move on to the next question so here there is a 45 year old male who has suffered from a motorcycle accident that is fine he had a high speed collision after the accident the patient was apneic at the scene and that is why he was intubated and then he was shifted to the in the er and uh, yeah what you noted was you noted that the patient's left pupil is dilated and sluggishly reacting to light now this is very very important thing okay so here uh, okay so the question is trying to ask you what is the pathophysiology behind this dilated pupil so i'll just summarize the question for you again here there is a 45 year old man who suffered from a road traffic accident he was intubated he was shifted to er in the er you found that his left pupil is dilated and sluggishly reacting what is the pathophysiology behind this sluggishly reacting dilated left pupil what is the cause the cause is a uh, patient is suffering from a uncle herniation okay so here there is a herniation of the uncle process of the temporal lobe which is actually compressing the oculomotor now so let me just get to this particular question now this is what you use to localize if at all there is any uh, intracranial lesion or not okay so let's say the patient has come to you with a road traffic accident maybe the patient suffered from a bleed may it be an edh may it be an sdh that particular edh or the sdh is causing pressure over the brain and because of this what is happening there is a uncle process which is herniating so here you are able to see that the uncle process is actually herniating through the tentorium cerebelli it is herniating down and what it is doing it is basically compressing it is compressing the epsilateral oculomotor nerve okay so it is basically compressing the epsilateral oculomotor nerve and because of this the patient's pupil is getting dilated now this is what you use in order to localize the lesion now no doubt today if you ask the investigation of choice is a non contrast ct scan which will definitely tell you that there is an intracranial bleed but let's imagine 30 40 years back no ct scan so how did they use to interpret whether there is any intracranial bleed or not with the help of one of like this is just one of the signs which used to help them in localizing whether there is any intracranial bleed or not and if at all it is what side it is so whatever the side the pupil is dilated the same side may be the hematoma is there okay i hope you get this this is what you use to localize the intracranial lesion so the crux of the matter is because of the uncle herniation there is a compression of the ipsilateral oculomotor nerve and because of this you get a dilated pupils on the same side which are sluggishly reacting i hope you get this particular point now moving on to the next question what is this investigation which has been shown in this particular image is it an ercp mrcp t tube cholangiography or a hida scan now this was a question which was asked in one of the central institutes recently so what is the answer to this particular question the answer is t tube cholangiography okay so the answer is t tube cholangiography so first let us understand what is this t tube why do you use it and why do you perform a t tube cholangiography so what is a t tube you are seeing these kind of uh, elastic tubes over here these are what's uh, what called as a t-tubes where do you use it so you use it in a cbd exploration so let's say you have a cbd stone you explode the cbd you remove the stone and when are you like when you are about to close the cbd you close the cbd over these t-tubes the reason is why why do you want to put this t-tube over like when you are closing the cbd one of the reasons is to prevent the cbd stricture that is fine but the more important reason is you have to look for any retained stone okay so what you want to use this particular t-tube for you want to use it to look whether there is any retained stone or not because we are humans we all can 
kind of uh, screw things up so what can happen even when you perform the cbd expedition maybe a couple of stones were still there in the cbd which you missed okay and it won't it won't be a good thing right if you just remove this t-tube out so before removing this t-tube you have to confirm that the entire biliary tree that is the entire common bile duct it is kind of free of any stone so how do you perform it so this is how you actually place the t-tube inside it okay so i hope you're able to appreciate the two ends are basically in the common bile duct one is towards the liver one is towards the intestine and the third long end it is being basically brought out of the abdomen and yeah this is basically being brought out of the abdomen so what you do is on post operative day 7th or 8th you perform a t tube cholangiography how do you perform it with this particular end you put the dye inside it okay so you put a dye inside it on the post operative day 7th or 8th so if at all you perform this what you will get you will get an image like this so here you are able to appreciate that these are the intrabiliary reticles which are dilated and that is the dye is basically going to the intrabiliary reticles and at the same time the distal part of the CBD can also be visualized and I have just kind of colored the black that is a t-tube so this is the same image which I showed you in the question so whatever the t-tube is I have just covered it black so I hope you are able to appreciate once you put up a dye through the third end of the t-tube the dye gets filled up in the intrabiliary reticles and the rest of the CBD if at all there is any stone, you will have a filling defect. But if at all this T-tube cholangiography is clear, there is no stone, you can remove this T-tube on post-operative day 9th or 10th. Okay? But if at all the stone is still there, you have to keep this T-tube for 4 to 6 weeks and after that you can remove it and put in a colloidoscope and then you can remove the CBD stone. Okay? So that is a management of a CBD a stone that is completely different. That's fine. What is this investigation? This investigation is a T-tube cholangiography. Why are you performing this? One of the main reasons of performing this post-operatively is to look for any retained stone in the common bile duct. I hope you get this. When do you remove it? If at all there is no retained stone, you remove it on the post-operative day 8th or 9th, like the T-tube. You remove on the post-operative day 8th to 10th after performing a T-tube cholangiography on the post-operative day 6th to 7th. Okay? So this is all about this particular question. Now I'll just talk about the other investigations as well. I'm pretty sure that most of you would be aware of it. I'll just press it through. So what is this endoscopic uh, like ERCP? So this is basically endoscopic retrograde corangiopancreatography. So when you would see a normal endoscope, what do we have? We have the end channels. Okay, so in a normal endoscope or whatever upper G endoscope we have for the diagnostic and the therapeutic purpose, usually we have an end channel. That is the end of the endoscope is the one from which the light comes out from which the kind of the catheters or whatever the instruments you put they come out from the end of the kind of a scope but in the ERCP you have a specially designed side channel kind of endoscope so I hope you're able to appreciate here as a side channel there is a port from which the guide wire from which the camera you're able to see everything so this is a kind of a ampulla you can basically cannulate it you can put up a dye through it and this can help you in visualizing the bile duct as well as the pancreatic duct so this is how you perform an ERCP I'm sure many of you would be doing this. I'm just brushing it through. And this is how the image looks like. Okay. So this is the endoscope which you're passing. And I hope you're able to appreciate this is a kind of a guide wire which you have passed inside the biliary tree. And again, you are basically seeing that the intrabiliary radicals are basically kind of filled up with the dye. So this is what is an ERCP which you perform for the biliary tree. Similarly, you can also cannulate the pancreatic duct and you can have a look at the pancreas as well. So this is the process of an ERCP. Now, what is this? This is a kind of a MRCP. What are you able to see in here? This is an MRCP. Now, MRCP, it is a diagnostic procedure. So here it is just a kind of a specialized MRI which you're seeing, which helps you in kind of looking at the intrabiliary radicals and the bile duct properly. So what is this particular image? This is a image of a bile duct injury. I hope you're able to see this is a common bile duct. And because of the rent, all the bile is basically leaking out from there, which is very, very well picked up by the MRCP. So just to recollect, what is an investigation of choice for a CBD injury? It is an MRCP and which is very well visualized in this particular image. I hope you get this particular point. Now, the lastly, we have a HEDA scan. What is a HEDA scan? HEDA scan is a procedure in which you basically inject a dye intravenously, which is being picked up by the liver and it is being excreted into the bile. So after it is being picked up by the liver, it is excreted in the bile. So wherever the bile goes, this particular dye will go and it will cause the hyperintense lesion over there. So what is happening in this 
uh, the die is basically being picked up by this and what you are able to see this this is a gallbladder so this is a gallbladder which is being filled up with the die and that is why you are seeing this okay so this is a HEDA scan which is being performed now this is useful in diagnosing the acute cholecystitis why because it will uh, normally the gallbladder is very well visualized in the HEDA scan but if at all the gallbladder is not visualized it indicates that maybe the patient is having a acute cholecystitis okay so this is an investigation this is the HEDA scan where do you use it you use it to diagnose um, acute cholecystitis okay right this brings us to the last question of this particular short quiz so there's a patient who presents to you with a non-blanchable erythema without breach in the epidermis so there is a patient who is having a pressure sore which has a, a non-blanchable erythema without breach in the epidermis what is the stage of the pressure sore like uh, bed sore rather so what is the stage is it stage one stage zero stage two or stage three now when I usually ask this particular question, if at all the students have not kind of ever gone through the classification or maybe they are not able to recollect, they go in for a stage zero. But the point is, there is absolutely no stage zero whenever you classify the patients of a bed sore. So answer is stage one. Okay. So let us walk us, let me walk you through the staging of the pressure sore. I'm sure you must have gone through this table at least 10 to 20 times. I'm just trying to emphasize on a couple of points. So just stay with me. So here what we have. In the stage when if you will kind of notice it is a non-blanchable erythema okay so it is a non-blanchable erythema and there is no breach in the epidermis so this is some kind of unique so you are basically looking at a classification of a bed sore and in the stage when you do not have any breach in the epidermis or the dermis and you have an erythema and the characteristic point is it is a non-blanchable erythema okay if you just compare it with the stage one or the first degree burns so here at the at that point you have a blanchable erythema so if at all the examiner wants to trick you in they might give you a blanchable and a non-blanchable in the options please understand in the bed so stage one you have a non-blanchable erythema without any breach in the dermis and the epidermis okay another way the examine examiners try to fool you up is they will give you that there is a partial thickness loss of the epidermis what is the stage of the bed so again if you wouldn't have gone through this particular table you will think that okay partial thickness loss of epidermis what can be less than this there can be nothing less than this and you will end up marking stage one but please understand the breach in the epidermis it starts from stage two so i'll just walk you through it again these are the two things which you need to understand rest is kind of very very simple so stage one is non-blanchable erythema without breach in the epidermis stage two is uh, partial thickness loss of the epidermis or the dermis what is stage 3? Stage 3 is full thickness loss of the epidermis and the dermis but important point is the fascia over the muscles it is not breached and the stage 4 is it is again the full thickness loss of the skin along with the breach in the fascia and you are actually involving the underlying muscles bones or the tendons or the joints okay so three and four very much understandable nothing great about it what you need to remember is stage one and stage two stage one is non-blanchable erythema without breach in the epidermis stage two is partial thickness loss of the epidermis and the dermis okay stage three full thickness loss but fascia is not involved stage four is you involve the fascia you reach to the underlying muscles bones joints whatever okay so this is about the staging of the pressure sword which i want to kind of talk to you about Thank you so much for joining with me guys in this particular video. I hope you like this. I hope it added a bit of a value to your life. So we are doing and we are organizing lots of courses on our plus platform. Please feel free to kind of explore them by clicking on the link below. You will be directed to my page. If at all you find any of the courses of your use, please consider joining it. We are trying our best to give you the best value added content on the platform. If you want to join any of the courses, you can use my promo code that is dr.pavan and you will get around 10% discount on whatever the course you choose. Thank you so much for joining with me guys. It was indeed a pleasure interacting with you through this particular video. I hope you liked it. I hope it added some value to your life. Stay safe. Happy studying. See you next week. See ya. Bye.